Um, and now I have real pleasure in welcoming our keynote speaker for the morning, Baroness Jill Pitt-Keithley. Jill has worked on, uh, with or in the voluntary sector for over 40 years. She became a Labour peer in 1997. She's a deputy speaker in the upper chamber and deputy chair of committee. And very recently, she chaired the House of Lords Select Committee on Charities. She was chief executive of Carers UK. She's been a chair and trustee of many charities, chair of the New Opportunities Fund, a founder member of Akivo, and has just been confirmed as president of NCVO. I think it's fair to say she knows her stuff. <laughs> I think it's also very true to say that Jill's a committed champion of the sector and one who is very clearly determined that we should be the very best we can be. But also, having known her for a very short while, but having known her by reputation for rather longer, I know that she's unafraid to tell us when we need to do better. It is a real privilege to welcome her to our stage today. Please welcome Baroness Jill Pitt Keithley. Well, I often say at events like this that my first name is Jill, uh, and that's because uh, I was on American television once and they thought Baroness was my first name, and they asked me if I'd like to be called Bar or Nessie. <laughs> so uh, anyway, thank you very much, Jane. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here, and uh, I must say that hearing Matthew, my glass how full attitude has been severely tested this morning, but anyway, uh, I think we will take a lot of, uh, of very good stuff away from that. Now, I don't need to tell anybody in this audience that charities are the eyes, ears, and conscience of society. They mobilize, they provide, they inspire, they advocate, and they unite. I've worked in or with the sector for most of a long working life, and so I was very delighted to be asked to chair the House of Lords Select Committee on Charities, not least because Labour peers don't get asked to chair many select committees. Um, it was not the easiest gig I've ever had, and I've chaired some tricky ones in my time, um, but we did manage, after much robust discussion, uh, to reach a consensus report. We came up with 100 conclusions and 42 recommendations. Now, the timing of this committee was significant. Uh, we were convened in the summer of 2016. It was recognized that we're living in a time of profound economic, social, and technological change, and that the environment in which charities are working is altering dramatically. In addition, you will all remember some high-profile failures in the charity sector uh, that have really eroded trust. Kids' company closed almost immediately after receiving millions in public money, and the public was shone on, uh, the spotlight was shone on possible trustee failure and a lack of due diligence. At about the same time, newspapers published a series of reports alleging that some of the best known charities in the UK had used exploitative and unethical fundraising methods. So it was the right time to set up the committee which focused on the charitable sector. I've been told many times that the report, it's called Stronger Charities for a Stronger Society, and I'm sure you've all read it line by line, is an important milestone for the sector. Over 11 months, we had more than 250 submissions. We saw more than 50 witnesses to give oral evidence. We made visits in and outside London. We hosted roundtables and all sorts of other things in order to continue a wide range of issue, issues relating to the sustainability of the sector. We felt it was most important for the committee to increase the sector's confidence in itself to give acknowledgement and recognition, and I'm therefore very pleased that it's been so well received by the sector. In a pretty difficult environment for charities, the consensus that we achieved seems to have been particularly helpful. Several commentators have said it is in effect a roadmap for strengthening the sector, and that's how I very much hope it can continue to be used. Now, the normal process for one of these select committees is you submit your report and you expect that the government will respond within three months. Um, now, our report was published at the end of March and the election was announced the next week. Uh, so that threw the timetable into confusion. 
Uh, we are still waiting for a response from the government, though I have met the minister and she has assured me several times, and her officials have assured me several times more, that the response is imminent. Uh, I, I hope I will get it in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if I were you, I'll just give you a little clue. I wouldn't hold your breath that there will be any legislation, in spite of the fact that we suggested legislation, I wouldn't hold your breath for legislation, but I'm sure that it will be a positive response. Some of our recommendations were definitely for the government. For example, better consultation with the sector is vital and it must be improved. Commissioning and relationships within the contract culture must also be improved and more encouragement given to consortia in the bidding processes. A consultation should be launched about employers giving time off for trustee duties. And the impact of devolution and the impact of Brexit on the charitable sector have scarcely been considered and must be addressed. And I'm delighted to see there's a session about Brexit uh, later today. We make comments too on the Charity Commission itself going through major changes at present and considering whether to charge charities to part fund its services. We raise concerns about this and emphasize that if it goes ahead, we must be clear that what benefits for the charities would be, and it must ensure that the burden does not fall on the small charities who won't be able to afford it. These and other recommendations will be pursued by me and members of the committee in a debate in the Lords when the government response is finally received. But you may have noticed recently that the government announced that a cross-departmental initiative would be set up to ensure better communication with the sector. My select committee and I fully intend to take credit for this development um, because we did recommend it and I have been ensured that when I finally do receive a government, from the, uh, a government response, the select committee on charities contribution will be acknowledged. So watch this space and I hope you will all protest if we're not given that acknowledgement. But many of our recommendations were not for the government, but for the sector itself. And they don't have to wait for a government response. They include our recommendations about governance. Good governance, as we all know, is essential to a strong charity sector. Charities need strong governance with robust structures, processes, and good behaviors in order to deal effectively with their beneficiaries. <coughs> We call for new efforts to provide training and development for trustees and recommend that charity boards should be engaged more than they are in self-reflection, in checking out how they operate, in appraisals, for example, examining their behaviours and measuring their impact. We urge infrastructure bodies to identify any shortcoming in the provision of such training and advice and do more to raise awareness about what does exist. Many of our witnesses felt there was plenty of material out there, but it's hard to find and it's not coordinated. We were very concerned about the lack of diversity on many trustee boards. Of course, boards should reflect their beneficiaries in terms of ethnicity, age and background. But when the commonest way of becoming a trustee is still because somebody asks you, boards are almost bound to be limited to the same kinds of people. We know that charities are concerned about the supply of trustees. How do we get them? Where are they going to come from in the future? And we felt in the committee that we need to emphasize much more that this is a two-way street. You give something of a trustee, sure, but you get something back. Is it something for your CV? Is it recovery from an illness or a bereavement, perhaps? Do you want to learn a new skill? These are all perfectly valid reasons for becoming a trustee, and those recruiting sh trustees should be more open about this. Employers have a role to play, too. We recommended that the government should hold a public consultation on introducing a statutory duty to allow employees of organizations over a certain size to have time off work specifically to perform trustee roles. As I say, I don't think you should hold your breath about any legislation forthcoming on that, although I'm sure that there will be more encouragement given uh, to employers by the government. 
To encourage turnover on boards, we uh, suggest that nine years should be a maximum term. While we consider that there may in some circumstances uh, be a, a, a role too for paying trustees, we don't support payment as a general rule. Um, I know that's controversial, but we don't support payment, payment as a general rule, but encourage a more generous interpretation of expenses uh, for volunteer trustees. Now, I'm delighted to say that the sector has taken up the challenge and is using the report to help them further the recommendations, using it as a roadmap, in fact. NCVO and Akivo convened a group of 15 membership organisations and set up a series of working groups to see how this joined up approach can help make the proposals in, report, in the report a reality. And I'm sure some of you are in, uh, engaged in those working groups. They include governance, diversity, leadership and campaigning. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that I've done quite a lot of speaking gigs uh, for, since this uh, report has been published. And I thought I would just uh, reflect with you some of the, the questions that have most frequently been asked me in those sessions. Uh, I'll focus on, on just three. The first one is how you strike a balance between what you ask of small charities and large charities in terms of the demands you make of them. 80% of charities have no staff at all, as we, as we well know. And this issue of how you say something which can be relevant across the huge range of the charitable sector that we all know about in the 167,000, is it, uh, that are registered as charities. Uh, it, it is very tricky, and, and we did struggle with it. But I'm pleased to say that small charities have said they find it useful. Many have been delighted that we say how important grants still are to such charities, which may not be set up to take on contracts. The funding of charities has changed very significantly in recent years, as we know. Public sector grants have mostly been replaced by contracts, often with very complex commissioning processes. And these have really disadvantaged smaller charities, which struggle to bid for services at scale. And they've acted as a break on the innovative side of charities too. And we were very concerned about charities who are, in my view, the seat of innovation in our society, about that bit being squeezed out of them uh, by, by the whole uh, contract culture. We recommend, therefore, that government provide support for the setting up of bidding consortia and starts promoting commissioning based on impact and social value rather than on lowest cost. We also recommend that local government recognise social value considerations in public sector commissioning to recognise that you get added benefits from charities. Uh, and, and I think that whole relationship uh, between local government and charities, uh, you know, the local government not really recognising how well charities know their local areas and how uh, they know the needs and know how to address them. And equally, they know how not to address them, uh, which very often a, a larger authority doesn't know. Uh, one of our visits was very interesting. We went to Manchester and uh, we had all the officers and uh, politicians uh, in the room, first of all, and we said, what's your relationship with the charitable sector like? They said, fantastic. They're absolutely marvellous. We never move without consulting them. Uh, you know, we, we, they're in at the beginning. They're, they're, you know, it's absolute level playing field. Well, of course, you know what I'm going to say. When the charities came in on their own, it was a very different story. And I, I see some, uh, some nods in, in the room. You recognise that scenario. But we must continue to urge local authorities not only to engage properly with the sector, but not to turn their backs entirely on grants, but to recognise that they are important, indeed in some cases essential. And I'm delighted that the Access Foundation uh, will be presenting to you later because they have proved how important grants, the blended funding of grants and investment is being uh, to charities. Many of our witnesses mentioned the importance of having core costs funded. As we all know, there's been increasing emphasis on reducing back office costs. All the money's got to go to the front line. 
But of course, charities simply can't operate unless their core costs are met. And these must be included in contracts, just as they always would be in the private sector. You would never dream of having a contract in the private sector without having your admin costs, however you define them, uh, uh, met. And we also recommend longer term contracts to ensure that they can be delivered sustainably by charities who can then plan for the future. Um, you know, I, I'm sure many of you have the experience. You don't hear for nine months what your uh, funding is going to be, by which time you've already had to issue redundancy notices to your staff before you apply for the next uh, lot of funding. And we also recognise that while volunteers are a most valuable resource, they are not cost-free and more resources should be provided for volunteer managers to make the best possible use of the generous contribution of volunteers. Um, the second thing that's come up is the lack of progress on digitization. Uh, and again, you've got sessions about this. The record of charities in using digital platforms is very mixed and progress is really rather disappointing. Some charities are at the cutting edge, as, as we well know, but many, too many, have yet to re realize its potential with regard to fundraising, volunteering, and communication. Um, and, and getting in specialist trustees, uh, perhaps younger trustees who've got some expertise uh, in this area, if me and my grandsons are anything to be, uh, uh, to, uh, to be considered. So it seems reasonable to su suggest that most charities could have a simple website, regularly updated, and or a social media page and actively considering recruiting a trustee with skills in that particular area might help the age profile of the trustees, uh, as I say, as well. And the third issue that's come back, uh, up is how we emphasize evaluation. We do say in the report that charities should check up on themselves. Are they fulfilling their mission? Are they reaching their beneficiaries? We're very keen that charities do that, but of course, you have to balance that with not imposing burdens on charities, not too much reporting and paperwork. How many hours do you send, uh, send filling in different evaluation forms for small amounts of money uh, and so on? Could we not get a bit more communication uh, there? I'm reminded of my, family, uh, my father's maxim, you don't fatten a pig by weighing it, you fatten a pig by feeding it. Um, all charities should, of course, be seeking independent evaluation of their impact on their beneficiaries in order to ensure that they're delivering for them. The form will vary considerably, but commissioners should also assess such evaluation when considering contracts. And it's also a way of feeding back information regularly to your stakeholders uh, to enable them to help with measuring success. And we believe the Office of the, of the Civil Society should develop guidelines on evaluation, bearing proportionality always in mind. Let me end where I began by mentioning the trust society has in charities. There is no doubt that trust in charities did take a knock. It may be getting better, but we can never take it for granted. Levels of probity and transparency must be constantly monitored. Charities' confidence in themselves is important in this regard, and I hope what the report has done has increased the confidence of the charitable sector. I'm reminded of a quotation from Dawn Austrick, who is one of our witnesses. She said to us every day she gets up and is struck by what charities contribute. It is glorious and a wonder, she said. Amen to that. Charities face greater operational and environmental pressures than ever before, but their principles are enduring, and they have always helped society through the kinds of periods of upheaval that we've heard about this morning, such as the ones that we are, and such as the ones we're facing at present. I've no doubt they will continue to do so. Thank you. I think Jill will be with us over the tea break mm -hmm. for a little while. Mm -hmm. So if you have any questions, which I'm sure you have, do please go and, and grab her. Sorry.